we have next uh, Dr. Luera. And I'd like to just bring in a little introduction on him. Uh, Dr. Luera is uh, currently the acting director of the Division of Geriatrics um, during the absence of uh, Dr. Goodwin. Uh, he's associate professor in the Division of Geriatrics with over 30 years of experience in patient care, uh, which have concentrated on the care of older adults. Uh, his main area of interest is uh, contemporary and alternative medicine use in racial and ethnic populations where appropriate data actually does exist. Uh, specifically, his research is designed to analyze previous collected data that would, oh, sorry, okay, that would advance scientific knowledge of the use, effectiveness, and outcomes of CAM in minority populations, and study patterns of CAM use and the types of problems that you can expect, as well as characterizing differences in CAM use among racial and ethnic groups. And I'd like to bring in Dr. Luera. His, his topic is contemporary alternative medicine use in older populations. My interest in um, alternative medicine came about through the back door. <clears throat> when I first uh, came to the U.S. as a professional um, and started reading some of the literature, I, I, my interpretation of research in alternative medicine use or the general concept was a little biased in, in uh, erroneously directed, and we still have that association of alternative medicine and some of its exotic disciplines associated with minority groups within the U.S. population. So that's how I became interested. Uh, as all of you are health professionals, as I am in our healthcare system, I wanted to make something clear in um, knowing that probably the most difficult and confusing part of it is how do alternative medicine people refer to us? And us is what is usually referred to as traditional medicine. Red button, red button. And, and that's the one I've heard, or conservative, or Western. And I think all these terms are a disservice the, uh, to, to what we are. And we shouldn't be embarrassed. We're, we are trained in allopathic medicine. That is, the other medicine different from alternative. And what is alternative? Well, you take a pick. There's about 60-some different definitions, so we're OK. But if we talk about. Oh, he's a doctor, and then what kind of doctor? Oh, yeah, alternative medicine. And he, oh, he's the other one. Well, let's use allopathic. There's no embarrassment. And, and, and you will find, pick an article and say, the traditional doctors. Well, Chinese medicine consider themselves very traditional, so are we talking the same? You know, we need to know what we're talking is about oranges and not apples and other fruits, <clears throat> but I've always found it interesting that when it comes to referring ourselves to what are we, well, we're, we're the other. We're the allopathic medicine and should look straight at their faces and not feel embarrassed that we're not alternative. Am I biased? No, alternative medicine is very interesting field, very challenging, uh, and it's trendy. Um, everyone wants to say, I do alternative. So, allopathic medicine is, allos means different. So it means I will give you a treatment different that will make you feel different from what you are feeling. And you're feeling sick, so I'm going to make you feel better. We all know that <clears throat> that is 99.9% .9 true and sometimes we really make them feel different. So <laughs> it's intended, the principle of how we were trained in all our different disciplines is to prevent disease and also cure disease. And it's a matter dealt, and these, I, I include some of the older definitions, matters dealt by physici physicians and surgeons like, whoa, you know, like where are all the other disciplines, you know. But the wonderful world of geriatrics, we know. We're probably the more interdisciplined uh, field in all medicine, where we don't have to 
learn what the dis discipline's abilities are. So getting to alternative medicine. Today, the, the more, if you're into alternative, you have to be and get with it. And it's no longer alternative, it's integrative <coughs> medicine. Okay. One thing that all alternative medicine researchers and practitioners have that allopathic medicine has lost it, uh, is their view of the patient or the individual. They see him or her as a whole. And some say, we're holistic. I agree. And every time I, I went to an association, the American Holistic Medical Association, really far out there, you know, really funny things, funny disciplines. But one thing in common, and I envied their attitude, was they are truly very holistic. They see the patient not as the hurting knee or the bad heart. They see that individual and say, how does your ailing heart affect your psyche, your family, your conjugal uh, relationships, all the thing. And that's something that, in a way, we miss in allopathic medicine, not so much in geriatrics. I think we have the touchy-feely part of it <clears throat> pretty good now. So alternative medicine is whatever you guys think it is, OK? I'm not going to argue. but. Uh, most of the graphs and the colored pictures I take, and they're fully credited to the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine, uh, highlighted, known as the NCCAM, which until recently was the Office of Alternative Medicine with about a $3 million budget. This is in the 90s. And then someone in government said, no, this thing is getting out of hand. Let's give them more power and more recognition. And they made it a center. And its budget now fluctuates between 300 and 350 million dollars. So, why do you think there's so much research? Add one in one. <clears throat> so, but they they're trying to do good, but at the same uh, same time they're coming under criticism of saying, "Hey, move it along. You don't need 300 million dollars to prove some of the things that some of the wackos and some of the wacky disciplines that." Credit, they can do certain things. We know it. They don't do it, you know. And there's that criticism of this is not moving fast enough. And the public demands more information. And that, that's, that's the urgency of it. But if we look and study alternative medicine, we need to approach it in a way that makes a little more sense. And this, all it represents is the, the whole of alternative medicine can be divided uh, artificially into groups or disciplines within the, the alternative medicine. And some call it like there are some medical systems. Probably the one you've heard more and more familiar and take almost for granted is osteopathy. Osteopaths in the state of Texas go through the same licensing board and requirements as medical doctors. So there's no big difference between one and the other. <clears throat> so other whole uh, systems, uh, we'll talk about it. And then we'll talk about what does alternative medicine mean when it's talking about <coughs> biological-based, energy medicine, mind-body medicine. I recently heard the latest coined phrase for mind-body. Mind-body is kind of scare some people away. So now it's brain body biology, Blah, the three Bs. I was at a conference that I really felt a stranger in because they were all, oh, the, are you into the three B or triple B? I'm like, oh, what the heck is that? <laughs> Finally, I asked someone that didn't look very threatening. I said, what's the triple B? And looked at me up and down like, are you an MD? Yeah. Like, oh, so you're not aware. Terminology is mind body. Mind body is like mind body. So, brain body is brain. Okay, I can understand. I've held the brain, so that, that's better. You know, I'm, I'm more comfortable with it. And then the ma manipulative and body based practices. Does this change the slide? I could change it for you. Okay, please. So whole body me uh, medical systems, as I said, uh, 
are some forms of organized medicine that developed from within our allopathic system or were developed earlier, you know, like before our allopathic medicine, barbers, priests, and who else? And so-called dentists were, were the people providing medical care, okay? So, it, so there are certain ones that, re, that are officially recognized, licensed, and accredited. If not in the USA, they are recognized in some countries or many countries, perhaps not in this continent. But homeopathic medicine, big in Germany, there are homeopathic universities and schools. It's, they're trying to do less harm to the body, human body, by trying to use remedies that uh, are naturally derived uh, ingredients. Naturopathy relies on uh, natural elements, air, water, sun, diet. Being a Mexican, this is not foreign. Uh, if you go to uh, native cultures, and even as I grew up, as kids, and today you will see it, you know, like a little newborn or a child, if it, the temperature just drops one, one degree down, you know, it's wrapping the individual in, in layers upon layers because they might get sick. So what the, the philosophy is air temperature can bring disease to a human body, cold air. And it was like, oh, if you had a bath, don't stand in front of a window. Like, why not? I drive faster. You know, like, <laughs> but it, it's the concept of pneumonia, cold, flu. And, and, and to this day, you know, if I go visit my mom, I'm, I'm kind of like shoes at the door. And then I walk barefoot, like, oh, you're going to get sick. You're going to, you know, like, because I'm touching cold. So cold, hot, hot, warm is fuzzy, positive, good. Cold, not so good. So it comes from, I think, our genetic or native composition brings that with us. You know, like too much sun, we all know, can cause certain harm. And then Ayurveda, uh, probably India is a better example of, of this form. Some of their principles make a lot of sense, especially when we in geriatrics talk about longevity. They're based not on disease, but on you're a healthy individual, how do we preserve health? That's their thing, you know, so that's, that's tradition. And then traditional Chinese medicine, which is very vast, knowledgeable science. So this is what we were talking, sort of like upfront, and we would include ours, allopathic with there in the choices of homeopathic, osteopathic, allopathic. Let's talk now about biological-based practices. And Biological, by far the most common thing associated when anyone refers to alternative medicine is this uh, section of biologicals. <clears throat> it can be herbs, and probably the most common one are, are herbal products. And then we have foods and vitamins, and then special diets and supplements. Supplements came into being because that was a way of alternative medicine, producers of products, biological products, to get in through the back door. Bureaucracy said, well, no, you guys need to go under the Food and Drug Administration system. And they said, nah, we're not prescribed medications. We want to make bucks, a lot of bucks, and in a faster time. So after a lot, of, several decades of haggling, they finally came to an agreement, and then they decided upon supplement. And that allows them to bypass the FDA. Supplements, even if you go for your oil change of your car, you'll see supplements in an office, for sure. They're, they're really pushed anywhere you go, supermarkets, <coughs> grocery stores, even play matter a bear does one thing and all kinds of stuff. Next. And then we go to uh, energy. A lot had, back in the 19th century, this was really big. Energy was the big thing, and, and, and people were experimenting. And I don't know, I'll date myself, I don't know, 
I think we used to, I grew up in a small town. We used to visit someone, a relative in a big city, and there would be these people walking down the street, and you would pay to actually hold two metal handles, and then they would, a little box with a battery inside, and they would jolt you, and like, eh, like, ah, cool, you know, like, more and more, ah, you know, like, who would do that, you know? And I remember we being little kids, going with grown-ups, and grown-ups not thinking much about that, you know, like, maybe we should try it with our kids nowadays. <laughs> Behave, or else I'll jolt you, <laughs> you know, like, but that principle, They've used it for treating conditions. You know, there are true believers in the the power of energy measured and and controlled energy that can help align the cells in the body, like the positive side and the negative side. So, I won't say any more about that. Um, then uh, bioelectromagnetic bases. A whole host, but it, it's the same thing. And, and, and if you wonder, do we use energy like that for any treatment? Yes. Which, which one? Ultrasound. Ultrasound, but for actually treating a medical condition. Ten. Ten. Another one? ECT. ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. What cruder way of treating the brain, the mind? You know, we jolt it, and I refer patients, and like, and then he, they smile. Um, next. Other types of fields, and this is, becomes interesting because I'm sure we've all come across practitioners that do, do this, like the Kijong is, study of movement with meditation where you regulate everything you you learn to control your breathing and heart rates not just the breathing but you can slow your heart rate and it follows the belief that if you can do that you can control the body from feeling and becoming sick because it'll improve the blood flow and i remember sitting through a demonstration where this individual could control the blood flow. And I don't know, I, I, I don't think I spent too much time trying to figure out the trick, but it was he could control like his one arm getting circulatory system pumping up more than the left arm. He might have had a blockage or something, I don't know. But one arm felt hotter than the other one. And he didn't have anything to hide. It was like he was uncovered and he did the mmm and meditated in one, I don't remember what side, but felt warmer than the other. So control of circulation or blood flow is said to be possible. Reiki uh, is a form of channeling energy with a spiritual exercise. Uh, the practitioner is like your facilitator. They motivate you to do that. And sometimes they do a little bit of hands-on and then therapeutic touch. Uh, again, this is some experience that I had never not paid much attention to, but as, as a child growing up in certain areas, the further removed from access to physicians, there would be healers within small towns or villages where they, if someone, the, the examples I remember were all related to uh, accidents, uh, we on top of a tree, someone falling down the tree and not fracturing but hurting a lot, being taken to a healer who would sort of rub their hands and put their hands over the hurting area and then would say, okay, you're okay. And then it was like, oh, I feel better. So I don't know. Next. Within the bioelectrical and uh, biofield energies, there's many others like pulse field, magnetic, and we've heard and read articles. There's people on campus that have dedicated a number of their efforts and years and research to magnetic fields, to controlling pain, improving gait disorders, and then alternative and direct current fields have been utilized to improve patients' 
control of pain and gait disorders. Next. So we're now to manipulative body and base practices. Next. Uh, we need not say much, but massage therapy, it looks at muscle and connective tissue. Unfortunately or fortunately, it doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't involve joints. So it's only, for example, a physical therapist that has a massage therapy that can do both, but the massage therapy is limited to only working on muscle and fa fascia. Chiropractic practice, I probably don't need to say more. You probably know more about it than I do. But it is, the, the, they're, 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 if you want to really summarize their approach to dealing with problems, disease, and, and wellness is that there is an association ship of all parts of the body to the spine. And manipulating the spine can help you acquire a state of wellness and perhaps even improve and restore your health. Osteopathic, uh, as I said before, it's they receive in-depth, broad uh, training in, in allopathic medicine, plus they learn to utilize manipulation to relieve pain and restore function of limb. Next. <clears throat> Finally, we're, we're dealing now with mind-body medicine. Next. And this, <clears throat> it's the ability to improve the mind capacity to affect affect uh, bodily function and symptoms. Uh, interesting, but if you look in history books, patient support groups and behavioral therapy, meditation, prayer, mental, used to be listed under alternative medicine. As of the 20th century, the division stops here. These are considered alternative. These are considered allopathic. Why? Because they're acceptable, they've proven themselves useful, and these still there's a the competition for healthcare dollars as to well if I set up practice who else should be licensed and credentialed, and in the U.S. healthcare system a lot of the credibility that some of these disciplines lack is because the paying systems have not allowed them to be fully credentialed and included in the payment healthcare system. That's the big difference. It's not that they're not worthy, it's just that they're not in the mainstream of healthcare insurance payments. Next. Who uses, how much of this is all used? All the graphs, remember, are from the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine. They've been very, very uh, uh, forthcoming with uh, uh, Whatever research they're doing, they're making it uh, public. It is available in their website. So if you look at the yellow columns only, it's what are they using in the last 12 months? To, the blue one is ever used. And I question that. Like, how many times are you going to remember that you took an aspirin 10 years ago? So how many times are you going to remember what you used of alternative medicine? So this is one. This is the interesting one. So in the one year period, 62% of the US adult population, that is 18 to 65, how many of them use any form of, and that comes to 62%, pretty good number. And of the, the two other columns only represent what was the definition of alternative medicine when the person started asking these questions. Next. Another way of doing it is like by the same domains that we just talked about, uh, mind, body, biological, manipulative, and other forms, they divided it. And, it, and this is uh, mind, body, medicine. That includes prayer and other things, 52. Then if you look at uh, all biological products, my light is dying. And then manipulation, uh, whole medical systems, and then air energy is not as popular. The middle one. Oh, that, that star right there. Oh, that star.
I killed him. <laughs> that energy is Yeah. <laughs> Where was it? Is it that? Oh, cool. Okay. Right there. Just start right there. Yeah. No. Do this as laser. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, that. Okay. Me, 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 me. Okay. Next, please. So, again, repeating the same thing. About 36% of adults use Carol. 62% if you include prayer. How many of you consider prayer as a form of medicine? One. Yeah. I'm from a culture that is very, very easy on, on the praying approach. Um, anecdotally, like, by age, my stages, age stages, I remember praying for birthday and Christmas gifts as a teenager for the girl, <laughs> as a young adult in the 20s to get me past my exams. As an adult, I'm more selective now. Um, but for for health again let me let me just do anecdotal uh commentaries the 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 mexican uh people uh put a lot of faith in prayer for healing and if you're fortunate enough to be allowed into the back rooms in any church especially the old uh design the spanish construction there are usually rooms uh, that are called the miracle rooms. And what, or even if you go into the main church, you will see, like always, the altar, but uh, a whole bunch of saints and virgins and everything. And within their wear, their, their outfits, you will see a lot of little thingies that are pinned to it. And they are called miracles. And they were traditionally made out of uh, gold, silver, and now it's just copper and, and tin. But you, the, the person would say, like, oh, my father suffered a, an, uh, an industrial accident. The tractor ran over his right arm. Please heal him. And I promise I will pray a 1,000 rosaries or go to church every day. That was a promise for an exchange of a favor, of not for oneself, but usually for someone else, a loved one. And then the person would go out to the store in the church, interesting, uh, and would buy a little arm. And if they really wanted to make a great sacrifice financially, they would buy it made of gold. And then they would go pin it to the favorite saint, virgin, or the crucifix. And that was, I'm really trying to make amends so that my dad's arm. And those were called miracles. And then if you go to those miracle rooms, people would... And it's an interesting aspect of, of people's art and history where they would go to the trouble of drawing in a little tabloid, painting, you know, like water paints and everything, the scenario of how dad got run over by his tractor while farming. And then if, things hap if the miracle happened, no, even if it didn't, they would pin it and they would take it to the priest and the priest would have someone hang in it. There's walls with thousands of these things. So prayer does play an important part in everyone's attitude towards health matters. And if a loved one in our family is ill or dying, we pray for their soul and we pray for their body and things. Uh, whether it works or not, there, you can find many interesting references where prayer has been researched under research conditions, and even at a distance where a group was praying for an individual, not even in the same city, and where actually people, you know, those jaded, cynical researcher kind of guys would 
look at the individuals and say, God, it's getting better. Why? You know, like, who knows? And they attribute the influence of prayer to that. So there is some validity. It's what your faith tells you. Um, and you might consider that um, next a worthwhile uh, venture. I was saying earlier that it depends what time of the century it is, but some of these disciplines that we right now refer to as alternative will not be alternative in the near future. So body minds, you can read them yourselves. Next. <clears throat> uh, who in the US adult population uses alternative medicine? And, and here it's divided by very clearly distinct groups where the whites were 35% if they excluded megavitamins and prayer. So that was mostly biologicals and ma manipulative uh, type interventions. Almost 60%, Hispanics 28%, uh, African American 26 and then Asians were big when these two groups uh, were excluded. Next. So that's just repeating it with uh, rounded up numbers, next. Again, the NCCAM did part of their survey in 2002 was to break down like what were they actually using? And this is prayer, prayer for one's benefit or for others, natural products, and you can go on and then prayer groups. So, let me be biased and I'll make a commentary that prayer in a group, prayer for others and prayer for self, like prayer is prayer, but I think it's, it's hard to distinguish, like, when does it become a group prayer? And I, I, I highlight this because when, when you go to read a, an article, make sure before you look at the conclusions, look at what was their definition of alternative medicine and what did they define as any of these groups? Like, what did they define as prayer? because sometimes that can skew the graphs or the numbers or the results. So always look when you read something like, uh, this alternative medicine was very useful. Look at how they define that alternative medicine because sometimes we will, next, we will see that it's not the same things that they were comparing. Now, a little bit of information. As you know, uh, Dr. Markides has been the principal investigator in a large database, epidemiological database of uh, Mexican Americans living in the US, people over 65. He started investigating this since 1993, and I was lucky enough to be included. And we've been following this uh, cohort of, of Mexican Americans, and this is what they use. They use herbal medicine mostly, like 80%. And other forms, they use a little bit of massage, chiropractor, relaxation, and spiritual healing. And the definition of spiritual healing was that there had to be a practitioner involved. In other words, someone that declared him or herself a healer based on spirituality would direct the treatment. Oddly enough, there was 0% use of acupuncture. We hate pain. We're, so there was no acupuncture used. And th that was interesting because I always read articles where acupuncture was uh, one of the higher ones used by Mexican Americans. Next, who uses alternative medicine? Now, let me point out, this is what the adult US population uses. If you kind of generalize, you say, who uses it? It's usually college graduate or high school or, or community college trained individual, usually fairly socially independent, uh, 35 to 55 years of age, lives alone, who uh, uses alternative medicine, who was a former smoker and if you look at the whole population, women use it more than men. Next one. Now, amongst the Mexican Americans, women more than men, but it was usually just the opposite of in education. Those that had very little formal 
education, we're using alternative medicine. Most, uh, more from migrant people or born in Mexico that immigrated to the U.S. Also former smokers or someone that had never smoked. So even though gender is okay, this is similar to, these two are different from the general adult population. Next. Uh, what do they use it for? This is the U.S. adult population, uh, usually hurting kind of things, back pain, headaches, neck pain, joint pain, arthritis, a little bit of, of uh, in the psychiatric side of uh, anxiety, depression, more, more pain, more pain, and what was that? Recurring pain and another of the psychiatric, which is sleep uh, disorders. Next, what do Mexican-American elders use? Well, big majority, health maintenance and disease prevention. They're not using it because one of the other principles, and I, uh, let me make it very clear, it's only in the older old of Mexican-Americans, those over the age of 75, Probably 99% have Medicare. They have lived here quite a uh, while. They're not using it to replace allopathic medicine, as research said. They're not using it because they have trouble with access to health care. No, they're using it to maintain their health and prevent disease. So they're being a little proactive. A lot of the gastrointestinal disorders, like the adult population have, Psychiatric mood disorders like anxiety, and guess what? Pain, all forms of pain, arthritis and all that. And people with asthma were using it more. Next, why do they use it? Reasons for using it. This is the adult US population. Uh, and this is kind of fuzzy. Thought combined with, uh, see how they use conventional? Okay, allopathic medicine and CAM would be better than one or the other alone. Uh, it would be interesting to try. You know, the exotic always attracts us. Uh, <clears throat> that's why if you go to Houston, certain areas in H certain districts in Houston, you will find a lot of, uh, what are they called, herbal shops. If you go in, you're going to find all kinds of interesting people. Uh, and this, uh, conventional medical professional suggested it. Okay, and was, who was that, you know, a chiropractor or an allopathic physician? Who knows? Conventional medicine, too expensive. We're very much aware of this last one in geriatrics. Next. What do Mexican-American elderly, why do they use it? Well, the influence of an extended and large families. A relative recommends it. It worked on me. Here, use it. Take it. A friend, the same thing. Curandero. That used to be every article I ch picked out the first three or four years, Mexicans use curanderos. <laughs> eh, not. Less than 3%. Let me, let me be very specific. This is in the elderly. It doesn't refer to the adult Mexican-Americans living in the US. Health professionals, a very, very small amount. And they didn't remember who or how they got to it, but they used it. Next, what do they use? These are biological, natural-based products. The adult U.S. population, echinacea. My daughters use echinacea for everything. Like, oh, it's October. We need to start taking echinacea. Like, what for? Like, oh, it does this, does that, you know. And then I, I, I rejoice when I find an article that says unproven uh, benefits, and I shove it in their faces. <laughs> but they still use it. <laughs> Ginseng, ginkgo, garlic, glucosamine. Interesting, I don't know how many of you had the opportunity that even in the internal medicine grand rounds last year, glucosamine was acknowledged as it is probably the only product that we have nowadays that if you take long enough, some individuals' joints in the cartilage will improve. We have no such medications in allopathic medicine. 
So because it does some good, we've now called it, it's not our medicine, it's allopathic medicine. So if- Dogs take it in LA. Pardon? Dogs take it in LA. Mm-hmm. But this does have a positive effect, which can be shown radiologically that it improves. You're gonna to have to take it for a long time, anywhere from 10 to 14 months before you see any, and you have to take it on the recommended dosages, okay? And it, it is expensive in the long run, but it, it's a very promising product that in today's world, rheumatologists are now utilizing it. St. John's wort, peppermint, and so forth and so forth. Next. What do Mexican-American elderly use? Okay, this was more or less to summarize what the U.S. adult population uses, and these were some of the products. This I had made in 1993 slide. Hispanics, meaning all Spanish-speaking populations, utilize this, and Mexican-American elders utilize this. So if you look at the lines, there's some products that traverse the three populations and age groups. So we're all dealing with kind of a, a limited amount of products and nothing very exotic. Next. I wanted to see if, if, if the use of, of these uh, herbals had changed over time. And in 1993, these were the products. And then in wave four on, of Dr. Marquis's database, we looked at the things in Eh, you know, not really. <laughs> Next. Do we spend a lot of money? Yes, we do. Billions. This is for the products. This is for the fees of alternative medicine practitioners. That's a lot of money. And you have to keep in mind that this is 85% of that amount, of these amounts, is out of pocket. When you go, you pay. It's not like charge it to my healthcare system. It's out of pocket expense. Next. What do Mexican Americans do? Okay, I've, I've done it in two surveys and pretty much everyone is limited like, I'll try it, but I'm not gonna spend a lot. So everyone usually goes up to $50. A few will go beyond that and some will go and probably you, we, could, we would assume that Either these are the people hard to convince, those are the ones that have obtained some real benefit, or those are the ones that have so many comorbidities that they're willing to try everything. Next. How much do we spend with our famous, this is a list from one of the pharma, pharmacy internet websites, and they, took, they asked, what do elderly people consume the most? I only removed from their top 11 two antibiotics because it, it was just, you know, those are used intermittently. But of the top medications, hormonal, uh, thyroid drug, uh, hormone replacement, an antidepressant, something for the stomach, something to lower the cholesterol, something to, to control the blood pressure, and something to make the heart feel better. And these are old standard medications. That one and that one are probably the, the least expensive. But if you look at any of the other drugs, it's, it's a big whack whack out of their fixed income that they have to spend in drugs. Next. A little bit about polypharmacy, just to finish off, is that we know, everyone knows that the more drugs you use, the higher chances of a adverse drug reaction or drug-drug interaction, and nowadays drug-herbal interaction. And now if you look under polyherbal poly something, so instead of polypharmacy, now they're looking at polychem alternative therapy, e something like that. But one drug alone can put you at 15% uh, probability of a, a drug error, and this grows four or more drugs, then you're gonna be looking at the chances of error in administration. Next. Uh, probably looking at in another form is predicted or calculated interactions of drug-drug interaction on the white col clear column, 
and then the actual number of interactions. And when you go beyond five and then more drugs, it, you know, it becomes really a concern of uh, having drug interaction. Next. Things that we need to be aware of adverse drug effects in the elderly. Just the fact, age alone is a risk factor for uh, adverse drug reaction. Multiple chronic medical conditions. If your kidneys are not working uh, well, plus the decrease in, in renal function normal to aging, if depending on your body composition and the fact that you may have uh, you're forced to take a number of medications. That really puts you up high with adverse drug reactions. And, and I highlight this because as providers, you will be asked many times during your professional career, do you think I should take or use alternative therapy? My approach is, well, let me tell you, you have to be careful. And I start naming the things that they have to be careful. The decision to take it or not should be entirely to the patients and not the practitioner. Next. What do you do then? You know, how do we direct our patients to a safer uh, environment? Well, if you're going to use it, I think the, the patient needs to as assume at least 51% of the responsibility and not just take it and expect that everything is going to go fine. So in today's world, even the elderly are, there was a survey of are the elderly deprived or do they have the same access to internet uh, information resources? And the number, the, uh, the percentage of the elderly population going into internet is increasing dramatically and very fast. So not everyone has access, but today one member of their family or neighborhood or, or surroundings will search the information for them. So the more uh, websites that provide information, the better for the general public because if we were to make it that our responsibility of informing every individual of the do's and don'ts about alternative medicine, you would have to increase the amount of clinical time to do that. But when someone approaches me, I always make sure that they make time available to research what they want to do. They can still go to a library. They can still request someone. By telephone, well, you, you've got a pharmacy available to you. Call the pharmacist and request information. But always make the patient aware that if you make the decision of using alternative therapy, it is your responsibility to learn of what you're going to decide to use. And some of these are common sense things as to not all internet sites will give you the information. For the way I approach a website, I look to see who's sponsoring it. And if it's a pharmaceutical company, I don't look at it because it's going to have a little bit of bias. It's like if I go look for adverse drug reactions of a pharmaceutical company, they'll put the 0.01% sort of hidden in one little corner. Whereas if you look at a research uh, article, it'll make it m more obvious. So the same thing, just make sure that you know who is sponsoring that website. And if it's the, the manufacturer of, you know, uh, shark fin pills, well, don't, you know. Next. So I tell my patients, be informed, communicate. And with this communicating is tell your physician that you are taking alternative medicine because we're doing bad. We don't ask our patients that whether they take it or not. Several surveys show that uh, physicians, even at the best of times, won't go past 40% of asking their patients whether they're taking weird things. So don't rely on that. No. Uh, make sure that your patients uh, inform their practitioner that they are taking uh, alternative medicine. And that's the end. Do you have any questions? We have time for a couple questions. 
No questions. Uh, I had one. I was wondering uh, with the uh, drug and herbal uh, interactions, <laughs> are there some, not, I mean, some might be pretty aware of what they are. Are there some pretty common ones out there that people really, really need to be aware of? There, there has been um, quite a bit of interesting research. Some, uh, some of the research is coming out of some of our sister uh, campuses, San Antonio. Uh, they have several grants. Um, there are some natural products. Probably the most popular one is ginkgo. It has uh, some undesired side effects with uh, clotting and coagulation. Uh, the same thing with other, other products like ephedra, uh, clotting problems, saw palmetto, uh, clotting problems, cat's paw, clotting problems. <clears throat> uh, probably the same group of uh, products that I used, that I mentioned, uh, are, not, are not cleared renally as well. Uh, as they are in the adult when you give them to elderly people beyond the age of 75. But again, you know, this would, it would probably take several hours to even just list the products that have been already studied that uh, have shown to have uh, side effects. Um, there are some that, they're starting to develop a list of natural products or herbal medicines, if you want to call them that way, on, uh, uh, risk patients in which they shouldn't be used. For example, someone that has TIAs, transient ischemic episodes, or, or a recent uh, stroke. There's a list of, of natural products that are being uh, uh, made available that uh, there's a higher risk of a recurrence or complications. People that have had recent cardiovascular surgery, again, there's a, a growing list of products that uh, they're recommending should not be used. Uh, some of the more natural, even uh, uh, some of the oil-based products are being seen to have side effects. And, and it may, the problem that we have is that you cannot attribute it to a direct effect of the product, but it's the, the way they're manufactured and the product that comes up here for sale. It may have some unlisted... Uh, components. So they know that sometimes the purity of the product that is being sold uh, is not guaranteed. So th uh, there was a study uh, by a Mexican uh, biologist just taking something as innocuous as chamomile because it's a very common herbal tea in Mexico in South America. He studied more than a hundred sources of the same chamomile. They just went around Mexico, South, and Central America and bought it. And then they classified it. They brought it back to their lap and they studied the purity. Uh, there was less than 2% purity in, in those 100 different uh, products of the same item. You know, chamomile, like manzanilla is, uh, we rear our uh, children since they're little tiny little things like that on uh, chamomile tea for colics, for whether they're doing bad in school, we shove uh, chamomile, you know, like, yeah, like. Made in what? So I think we don't have the guaranteed purity of the products is one of the bigger problems. It's not like you can go back to F the Food and Drug Administration and, and look and claim and demand the purity of the product being advertised. It, these are nutritional supplements and herbal products where purity is in question at, uh, at times, so that. Unfortunately, it's not um, regulated because of the Orient Hatch uh, law from 94, I think, mm -hmm. where essentially the FDA now has no say in the so-called nutritional supplements, so they can put anything in it, and the big scandal about uh, ephedra and marijuana and all this uh, herbs, you know, in the death time. Yeah, the, the fact that there's supplements, the only thing that they're called uh, to attention is when they make an, a false claim. Yeah. But they can put, like, l next time you're in one of these centers that is dedicated to that, um, look at what the bottle or box say. And they can claim a lot of things. But as long as they don't say, good for your blood pressure, they're OK. They can claim anything they want. 
Yep, yeah, by supplementing. Uh, the, the industry and the pressure it made, they have very strong lobbyists in Washington. And uh, it's a very important industry in the U.S. And not only in the U.S., but in, in, in other countries. Well, I mean, Hatch has uh, 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 stocks and uh, quite mm -hmm. an interest on, uh, on uh, I just need to add two, uh, two supplement companies in Utah. Does. So that's why mm -hmm. he moved Which forward the thing. I mean, he says that's not you think he could recommend some Well, yeah, it's like uh, I was just listening to the uh, dean of medicine. She was uh, speaking to the faculty at the <laughs> Department of Internal Medicine, and she made a, 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 a funny comment that she was wondering whether Galveston would still be in, in the same place the day after the elections because in a red state, meaning a <clears throat> Republican state, the island was blue. It voted blue. So, are there any other comments from the remote side? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, any other comments from the remote side? Hello? Yes, yes. can you hear? Uh, okay. Yes. We have a question at SFA. Okay. The question is, the question is, what um, is there a particular manufacturer that is better than another as far as alternative medicines go, or a particular country that mm. that produces? Um, better quality than another? Yeah. No, there, there are no particular uh, products or manufacturers. One of the problems in, in uh, relying on labels is that uh, uh, an example is several producing countries of the natural products send the product in bulk to the U.S. or to the American continent, and then they resell it to different uh, uh, sales outlets, and each one can relabel it at their pleasure, and they can change the listing because, like many products, they will add other things to make it last longer. They can add uh, starch, which is not uncommon. They can make a, a, a powder into a pill form. Others can make it into different uh, presentations, and even though they bought it from the same wholesale uh, country or agent, you're not sure who actually made it. Which, let me say something, you know, with the, the recent uh, debate on whether the U.S. Uh, states should be allowed the liberty to make their decision of purchasing pharmaceutical products in Canada or where else, one of the arguments from the government, that is the FDA, is saying we cannot assure purity if you buy this fluid pill under the name of furosemide in Canada it may not be the same furosemide that we make here in the USA. The alternative medicine products are even less regimented, so you don't know who actually made the product, and the people that sells it does not have any obligation to list the manufacturer or all the ingredients. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what is the government uh, or the professional division or any agency acting for the alternative medicine? Because alternative medicine uh, is a big market. Uh, Traditionally, it's billion for the product and for the services. So, like FDA or American Medical Association, what is the package for the alternative medicine? They are supported or no, no. Uh, it's the, the, the allopathic medicine groups represented by the American Medical or whichever one else you name, uh, they're not in the game of licensing disciplines. So physicians groups can't go around saying, we should not license so-and-so. That's the state's responsibility. And that's why each state has the liberty or the responsibility of licensing individuals in healthcare. And not all states are the same. Some disciplines in today's healthcare system don't even have a license in a state. Okay. So it is not the responsibility of the healthcare system or the physicians' organizations to grant or refuse licensing. 
if we're in Texas, it's the stack, Texas legislature that is responsible for recognizing and then licensing or setting up requirements for certain people that are working in the healthcare industry. That's it. There are federal guidelines. But again, uh, you have to understand that each group that we talk about of alternative medicine has a vested interest. The, the aspect why some disciplines are still not recognized is the people that control the purse, Medicare, Medicaid, and all the private health care insurance companies, some, well, let me ask you, how many of you know, does Medicare pay for alternative medicine? Does Medicaid pay for alternative medicine? It does. Yes. Okay. And it goes state by state. California and Texas are the most liberal ones. So Medicaid does pay for some alternative therapies. The, the problem is of credentialing and licensing. If any of the disciplines that we talked about were to come to the uh, licensing credentialing board of the hospital, uh, I don't know how they would react, but we don't have any so far. Okay. And that's why they're not trendy. That's why they're not so popular because in order for them right now, they have to rely on out-of-pocket expenditures. Thank you. Thank you very much.